Hi, this is Susie Daphnis and today we're with Mandy Johnson, author of Winning the War for Talent. And we're talking about how to attract and keep the people who make your business profitable. Now, Mandy's a former UK director and Australian HR head of Flight Centre, the very successful franchise. Her new book has attracted widespread coverage in the business media and is the topic of our conversation. In a recent CEO Institute survey, it was found that while what keeps most CEOs, business owners awake at night is sourcing and retaining skilled talent, they, we, are not prioritising recruitment and retention processes. And in this interview with Mandy, she comments that for many small businesses especially, recruitment is absolutely crucial, having good recruitment systems, because every person on the team counts as a representative of your brand. You'll find more information about this interview on our website at www.abn.org.au forward slash talent war. Let's go now to the interview and I will speak to you after the interview about some other great ways to engage your team for better performance. Mandy, hi and welcome to the program. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. Today we're going to be talking about how to attract and keep the people who can make our businesses profitable. But before we do that, tell us about the title of the book. Uh, It is Winning the War for Talent. But who is at war and why is there a war? Well, I think the, uh, the big thing here is that we have been recruiting people for the whole of the 20th century and it was really simple to get people. So, for instance, we had the Great Depression, we had women joining the workforce, we had the baby boom. So we never had a war for talent. We could be terrible at hiring and still get everyone we wanted. What's happening now is that the whole labour market has changed. And even though we've got areas of high unemployment, because we've got baby boomers leaving the marketplace and technology increasing, um, finding those right people that make our business profitable is all of a sudden really quite difficult. And so this is the war for talent, and it's actually getting worse. One of the things that I notice in the book, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is that the onus becomes so much on us to do a good job of recruitment uh, instead of, as you said, thinking, well, haven't I got an opportunity for you? So we'll get to that in a moment. The book really takes aim at complacent CEOs and outdated HR practices, and you even make a case as to why people like Richard Branson and Bill Gates wouldn't make it past most organizations' interview stage, and we'll look at that in a minute. But first, you cite a survey that shows that while CEOs claim that the thing that keeps them awake at night is sourcing and retaining skilled staff. On the other hand, they're not making finding and keeping talent a priority in their business. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, I think um, the the interesting thing is that most people, and because I consult, I get to have a sticky beak in a lot of businesses, most people have not changed what they do in their hiring or their retention, you know, probably ever or for a long time anyway. And so um, the reason why and what I've I've written in my book is that because it has been so easy to recruit people for so long, we've let our HR area atrophy. And you can see that because we have CEOs, we have CIOs, we have CFOs, we even have COOs, but we still have very few CHROs. Mm. And and because of that, it, it just hasn't been a priority for most businesses. I know from the work that we do with thousands of small business owners that what you're saying may be the case in bigger organizations, but it's also definitely the case in small businesses and people aren't making it a priority to plan and strategize how to go about finding the people that are going to help them go from being a solo operator to being a bigger business. Have you found that to be the case as well? Yes, look, I think in small business, it's actually recruitment is absolutely crucial because you have a lot less people. So every person counts because that's what your brand is judged on. And a lot of small businesses make the mistake of really not giving much focus to hiring. They do what I call hope recruitment, where they employ someone who kind of on the surface looks good. And then they spend hours managing that person down the track, you know, for bad behavior and, Mm. you know, or they turn over all the time and they, you know, they enter that constant spiral of recruitment. Um, And that's probably one of the the biggest mistakes I see with small businesses. If we can't find the people to hire, then is it that we're not really looking or is it something else? Well, I think it's a combination of two. I think it's that often we're looking in the wrong places. You know, we get quite fixed on the sorts of 
people that we want and often it can be something quite different. So just to give you an example, I was recruiting for fiberglasses with a company and they realised when I sat down and talked to them that actually women made great fibreglasses because they had small hands. And so they started, they never recruited a single female fibreglass before. So sometimes we can get fixed on what we want. Um, also, the unfortunate thing for employers is that the market is getting tougher. Because of technology now, even the most um, unskilled jobs now require a certain level of technology and that's making it a lot tougher even for small businesses to find people. I think one of the other things with small businesses is for many it's hard for them to find their points of difference that make them really yes. stand out. And so that's what, you know, if, if you're running a fish and chip shop, how do you make your fish and chip shop more attractive than anyone else's going for, back, for employees? Sorry, Mandy. Going back to the point you made earlier where I said that you put the onus on us, one of the skills that you list as being essential as a recruiter, so in small business I could be actually the owner, is that yeah. of sales and also demonstrating that we have achieved something and a business and are worthy of someone working for us. So, so. When did that change happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it sort of happened once the baby boomers started retiring and our, our pool of, of good people, start, you know, we actually, the pool of good people shrinking even though unemployment levels are rising. Um, and so what it means is now that the small business really needs to sell their benefits to people. And often when I consult with small businesses, they don't have any and they have to come up with some. So it might be that, you know, they, they um, create, you know, how do they create their clients? So, you know, a, an amazing client thing so that their customers become their customers for life. Or do they go to local businesses and source, source some discounts that their employees get, you know, servicing cars or, you know, at the local bottle shop, you know, that their employees get 5% off. So that when people come for a job, you know, they can offer them these extra benefits that they might not get from the, from the shop down the road. Mm. Could one of those benefits also be, you know, if you're an organisation that contributes to your community um, and sort of has a give back kind of approach, would oh. that be a selling Point as Absolutely. Well. Look, one of the big things that's happening and that I, I've seen as a change in the last 10 years is that people now want to work for organisations that inspire them more than just like a basic mission statement or, or financial goals. So, you know, inspiring people through different things like doing, you know, how do they contribute to the community. Um, it can also be flexibility of arrangements. Like my local bus company in Brisbane couldn't get people and so they made a shift time from 9.30 to 2.30 and filled all their staff with parents who wanted yes. to work, you know, Great. within school hours. Mm. Tell me, before we look at some of the qualities that good recruiters have, um, some of the other qualities, tell us that point about Richard Branson and Bill Gates. Why wouldn't they get a look in in most cases these days? Okay, well, this is related to the fact that hiring, to me, HR has, has totally atrophied because most businesses haven't paid it any attention. So what's actually happened is it's attracted a lot of bureaucrats. And so we have, and I'm sure everyone's read, you know, stories about HR bureaucrats. So what has happened is that we've systemised recruitment and, and we've so systemised it now that, you know, unless you have, you know, five years experience and this degree and that, you don't even get a look in. Now, if you look at Richard Branson, he dropped out of school at 16. Mm. Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard in his first year. They wouldn't even, if you look at the way application processes are structured now where you have to answer all these questions before you even get to speak to the recruiter, yes. they would, they'd get knocked back before they even got to an interview. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's the, at most people are not focused on the hiring outcomes, which is to get good people. They're focused on their processes. You know, have we got these elaborate processes that show that, you know, we're being, we're being um, uh, you know, we're being very consistent in our processes. But, of course, that doesn't get you great people. Mm. And when the pool of great people shrinks, you have to get far more innovative. Mm. One of the other things you tell us you have to do is move quickly. Talk to us about speed when it comes to recruitment. Yes, yeah, so well, everyone likes that old chestnut, hire slow, fire fast. And, unfortunately, that might have applied in the Great Depression when there were 20% of people out of work, but it absolutely doesn't apply now. I've used speed as a kind of lethal weapon in recruitment um, in many organisations. And how it works is if you um, advertise 
and interview and employ within one week and another company is taking three or four weeks, you've actually recruited the great person before they've even got to their to, the, to interview with anyone else. Mm. And so to me, you know, great applicants are like great houses. They don't stay on the market for long. The faster you move at that point, then the more great people you recruit. Um, and speed is so, you know, still so many companies don't use it. I, I'd just like to clarify here, though, that when I say speed, I'm not saying having bad practices rushed out fast. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have really good, you know, a great recruitment ad. You have really good tools that sell, uh, sell your, you know, you sell your business to people and that kind of thing. You have good interview and screening processes. But from advertisement to point of hire, you know, you do it within a week. Great. Got it. So I want to talk about attitude because I, I've heard this before and I want to ask you about it, that we should be recruiting for attitude and then training for skill. Let's have a look first at what sort of attitudes we should be looking for. Okay. Well, um, if you look at why most people don't work out in jobs, it's hardly ever for work skills, even though that's what most small businesses employ. So, you know, they might be late or, you know, they, they have confrontations with other mm -hmm. staff members. All of those kind of things are all about attitude. So what I did, the hard thing with attitude, though, is how do you measure it? And that's why so many people don't do it. So I spent five years actually tracking all my people to work out what were the top five things they had. And the most important I found was one was perseverance. Mm -hmm. So actually looking at their past and seeing what have they persevered in because what you'll find with perseverance is even when the going gets tough in your business, they, they will stay and work through it, whereas people who don't have perseverance will just keep you know, disappearing. Um, and the second one was demonstrated achievement in any field. Doesn't matter whether you know someone's the macrame champion of Australia or you know the under 16 rugby champion. Mm. If they have a pattern of recruitment, so one thing's not enough. But if they show a pattern of that sort of achievement, um, they have always been outstanding um, people in my businesses and, and in the places I've been consulting to. What about the staff member? Well, actually, two things I want to say. One is I've yeah. definitely had the instance of someone didn't seem to be performing and they didn't have the skill, but they hung in there and they did a turnaround and, you know, turned out to be a star. But then you have the person who is hired, who sells themselves well, who seems to on paper have the skill, is a really hard worker, but is really lacking the skill that is crucial to that role. Should I, as the employer, be wearing the cost of training or do I find someone else who has both the skill and a great attitude? Well, your first number one is to try to find one with both. So generally, there may, and, and you know, in some jobs, there, you know, like for instance, sales can be trained. So sales jobs, that kind of general job, then the work skills is not as big a deal. Obviously, if you're looking for a brain surgeon or um, something like that, you know, the skills become important. But often in, the, in a tight labour market, like we're starting to see again happening now, um, what happens is you can't get the skill. And so just to give you an example of that, when I started Flight Centre in the UK, we just could not get travel agents. So I employed archaeologists, school teachers, um, people that had run post offices and within three months because I recruited people that were high achievers and yes. were persevering Got within it. three months they actually had the skills so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about and they were fabulous they all say they went on and became leaders so that's where attitude really trumps skill in that case that's really, really interesting in that, you know, the past performance, whether it's in a different field, as you said, it could be athletic, is the best predictor of their future behaviour. That is um, that is really interesting because they're not, you know, sometimes people will put those sorts of things on their CV and you think, well, it's not exactly relevant, but it does demonstrate something about that person that perhaps it's we... It's a pattern. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, younger people don't have the pattern so much. It's harder when they're right. 19 or 20. But by the time someone's 35, you know, there's a definite pattern of, of <laughs> attitude there. Definitely. Um, I want to talk very quickly about motivation because uh, you tell us that if you get the right people for the role and the organisation, then the rest is reasonably simple. You don't have to performance manage them. Um, yeah. Again, you know, we've been through the stage where, you know, they have the company song and we're doing all these, you know, we're doing all these group activities. You know, is that still what motivates people or is there something else now that we could be doing that keeps people happy? 
Look, I think the bottom-up approach, and this is one that um, Zappos in the US is using, using a lot, and I've seen it work really well in small business teams. So if you're running a small business, um, the, the bottom-up approach is perhaps one of the single greatest things I've seen that keeps people, um, retains people in a job. And all that is, is when it comes to things like team planning, mm -hmm. the, the standard way most um, companies or businesses team plan is the manager comes in and tells everyone what they're going to do, and then it's like dragging dead horses across a desert. So what what I've found in, in um, my business and in my consulting is if you get the people in the team and make them actively a part of, a t of the plan, of coming up with the plan for the next 12 months, they are like an incubator of ideas. Mm. And I've seen some miraculous profit results from this is, you know, some businesses have actually doubled their profit when they've got the team involved in coming up with the plan because it almost doesn't matter what plan they come up with. If they own it, then they make it happen. So instead of one manager having seven people and the manager trying to drive everything, you've now got seven people in a team all actively driving it. So the outcomes are quite different. Mm. And I think that's one of the keys of staff retention is if people feel involved in where they're going. That's great. Now, um, we've covered a lot of things, but does anything you've said differ or not apply if you're actually recruiting a team of virtual staff? Because, you know, we're uh, working, as I said, with a lot of small businesses, and one of the recommendations we have is that they do consider virtual teams um, yes. because they're looking for the best talent where they can find it, you know, and they may yep. want to stay based out of a home office. So is anything different around virtual teams? Look, I think the thing with virtual teams, and, and I do think that virtual teams are the way we're going because time's a big commodity for people. So, um, you know, that's going to be more attractive to good people. But the one thing that's harder with virtual teams is retention because they don't get that interplay in the team. You know, um, when I was working for Flight Center, we did a study of the most profitable stores around the world, and the one common factor was that people had worked in a team together for 12 months. That was the only thing that was common. So team mm. dynamics are really, really important. Um, so what I would be doing if I had virtual teams is looking at ways that they can interact, that they can get rewards, recognition, social uh, interaction, even though they're virtual. So things like, you know, um, you know, uh, intranets and things like that where they can actually, you know, speak to each other uh, as a group are important. Ways that they could, say, reward and recognise each other themselves for great work so that they're still sort of connecting in and, you know, it's it's that, it's the how you get that team to interact and the communication as well, you know, sending out a monthly newsletter, that kind of stuff is really important when you've got virtual teams. Um, uh, you know, it is it is definitely a tougher, um, you know, tougher for people to have virtual teams than teams that are, uh, you know, physical. Okay, great. I think that's going to be really helpful to everyone listening. Mandy, we've covered a lot. Um, the book is chock full of strategies and point-by-point point, um guidance, if you like, for anyone who's looking to grow a team of people that are going to make their business profitable. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with today? Look, I think um, the single biggest thing for me is that most people focus on retention and, you know, that there's a lot of talk in the media about, you know, how do you keep people, you know, do you throw perks and whatever. For me, in all of my business experience, the one thing I've found is that if you focus on the other end, if you focus on the hiring and find the right person for your role and the right fit for your company, then it's the silver bullet for retention. 75% of your problems go away. So, you know, for me, really, and I know Jim, Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, actually said if he was starting a company today, the one thing he would focus on would be getting the best people in the world. So that would be, you know, what I would like to leave as my final thing because I do really think that's the key to any great business, that people are the heart, soul and balance sheet of every business. Mm. The book is Winning the War for Talent, How to Attract and Keep the People Who Make Your Business Profitable. Mandy Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Her Business with Mandy Johnson, author of Winning the War for Talent. You'll find more details about this interview and also how to contact Mandy at our website, www.abn.org.au 
forward slash talent wall. In the interview, you'll remember Mandy saying that people are the heart, soul and balance sheet of every business. Um, However, I still see businesses make the mistake of not focusing on the recruitment process and doing what she called hope recruitment, that is hiring a person who may look good on the surface, only to spend lots of time wasted in managing that individual and having them in the end leave or you having to let them go. Um, Even if you're a small business, Really having a great system for recruitment, I think, is really important and finding that suitable person for the role. And when someone is not turning out, which, you know, happens very, very often, being really honest with yourself and being gracious in how you let that person go. Um, I've learned time and again that when I've held on to a person because I didn't enjoy the recruitment process or because it would unsettle the team or I was too busy, I was displaying something that I've just termed hope retention. I kept hoping things would get better as time went on and more often than not, they didn't. So the bottom line is sometimes roles and people don't match up. So the best thing for your business is to recognize this and make the changes you need to make. I also found it interesting to hear Mandy say that to sell your business benefits and achievements when recruiting potential staff. And that's a real change in the way that we think about attracting people to our organization. So I start to think about what are we posting on our social networks? What are we saying about us on our About Us page? What are we projecting about our organization in any contact that a customer or potential staff member has with us? And really doing an audit of all that and making sure that it's up to speed. Um, Finally, one of the things that I'm definitely going to take on board is about the faster recruitment processes. And I know that we've probably lost uh, great staff because we've had a long process between placing an ad, how long we had the ad running, when it closed off, how we culled people, then we interviewed, then we made a decision. So really speeding that up and we actually are about to start recruiting for a role and I'm definitely going to take that bit of advice on. So once again, I want to thank Mandy for joining us and just remind you that you can order her book at all good bookstores and you'll find a link to purchase the book on our website at abn.org.au forward slash talent war. If you enjoyed this episode of Her Business, we'd really appreciate it if you would tell your friends. We want to share the great ideas that our guests bring to these interviews with as many people as possible. If you're listening on iTunes, which is what I really like to do with my podcasts, be sure to subscribe to automatically receive new episodes of Her Business as soon as they're released. And you can also access the library of past episodes there as well. And finally, we'd love it if you would leave us a review on iTunes. I'll put a link on how you, on our webpage uh, to show you how to do that that um, we would love it if you would help us spread the word on behalf of the Australian Business Women's Network I want to thank you so much for joining us here on Her Business and we look forward to welcoming you back really really soon